told them to. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I did that yeah. for <laughs> Do I have the audience? All righty. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, I'm going to talk to you now about something quite interesting, and that's the doctrine of predestination and election. So this, uh, this doctrine, uh, of course, is controversial in the church. Uh, this lecture, by the way, was predestined. Uh, so if you are upset with what I say in this lecture, just remember I have no choice in the matter. <laughs> this lecture is brought about by the irresistible will of God. Every word that I'm about to speak was predestined before the foundation of the world. Or so they would have you believe. Now, uh, I have a friend and he had a t-shirt that he made and it said, uh, uh, make predestination work for you. Repent and believe the gospel. <laughs> and at first I thought, oh, that's kind of funny. And then, you know, there can be some truth to that. In fact, uh, go to 2 Peter 1.10. Second Peter 1.10, Peter said, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. So here is introduced an element of human responsibility, human role in election. There's something that we can do to make sure that we're part of the elect. Now this would throw a wrench in the theological gears of the Calvinistic system that God has elected you for the foundation of the world. You have no choice in the matter. If you are reprobate, there's nothing you can do to become elect. And if you are elect, there's nothing you can do to become reprobate. So how then, if that is the meaning of the word election in the Bible, how is it that Peter is telling you that what you do will make your calling and election sure? We're also told in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 21 If any man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared for every good work. Now often the book of Romans chapter 9 is used for the doctrine of individual predestination where it talks about God making one a vessel of honor and another a vessel of uh, dishonor. One is a, a vessel for destruction. And the other is not. Well, here it's saying if you purge yourself, then you become a vessel unto honor. Again, showing an element of human responsibility that something you do determines whether you are a vessel of honor or not. But isn't God the potter and we are the clay? Isn't it God who makes us a vessel of one or the other? Well, yes, but in response to what we do. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 18. This is, you have to understand with the book of Romans and Paul's writings, he often refers to the Old Testament. And uh, you cannot properly understand what Paul is communicating if you don't understand uh, the context and the, you know, the sources in which he's using to support his his perspectives and his, what he is saying. So when Paul says in 
Romans that God is the potter and we are the clay. You have to go back to, uh, to where this is found prior to Paul and where is Paul getting this whole idea from. It's Jeremiah 18, starting in verse 2, or you can start in verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do to you, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. At what instance I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, then I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instance I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If they do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So this is giving an analogy of the potter and the clay not as God irresistibly forcing people to be what He wants them to be, but God dealing with the clay as it is and in light of its condition, forming it as a vessel of wrath or a vessel of honor. He said, you have marred yourself in my hand. See, the potter intended on making a different kind of vessel, but the clay marred itself. And in light of it marring itself, He made it a vessel of uh, as he saw fit. And so also, when Paul is saying that God is the potter and we are the clay, and he talks about the vessels of wrath that are fit for destruction, well, who did the fitting? Who, did, did God fit them for destruction? Or is it sinners who by their own sinful choices are fitting themselves for destruction? And because sinners have fit themselves for destruction, they have marred themselves in the hands of the potter, God therefore makes them a vessel of wrath. On the other hand, if we purge ourselves, it says then God would make us a vessel of honor. So there's a human responsibility connected with God predetermining uh, your destiny. Wh whether God's going to make you a vessel of wrath or a vessel of honor is in response to the choices you're making. And uh, given the context here in Jeremiah 18, you're not getting the idea that everything God wants, God gets, or that everything that happens is God's predetermined will. The context of the potter and the, play, uh, the clay is when he says, if I'm intending on blessing a nation, if I'm planning on blessing a nation, and they turn to wickedness, then I'm going to repent of my plans. I'm going to change my mind about blessing them. And if I am planning, like Nineveh, to destroy them, if I'm intending on destroying them, but then they turn from their sin, then I'm going to repent of my plans. I'm, I'm going to change my mind about destroying them. So this analogy of the potter and the clay being far from an irresistible and eternal uh, plan, as it's often presented, is quite the opposite. This shows a flexible future, a changeable course, one in which God... He makes his decisions in response to changing circumstances. And God changing his plans in response to changing circumstances. Well, if God is changing his plans, if God is repenting of his plans in light of new circumstances, then you certainly can't say all of God's plans uh, were settled and and, you know, in eternity's past. God is still making plans as things develop and as he observes the course of uh, our lives. So, what then is biblical predestination and election? I think that has been grossly misunderstood. 
And the reason is not scriptural, it's philosophical. You see, if you were to come to the Bible just as a new convert, you might, you're going to read the word predestination and election, but I don't think you're going to have those connotations to it unless you've already been exposed to this philosophy. Because the overall uh, context of the Bible, which we're going to see, is that God would want everyone to be saved and God's will is not being done on the earth. Uh, I remember as a new convert, I uh, read the Bible a lot and I, I was introduced to a Calvinist preacher, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, started reading his materials and uh, it said he was a Calvinist. He believed in predestination and I thought, oh, predestination, well I've read that word in the Bible. Election, I've read that word in the Bible. And uh, then I heard the Calvinist interpretation of those words. Now, I thought it was biblical because the Bible was using those words. But the person who defines is the person who wins the argument. And if you, if you redefine words to fit your philosophy, then you can prove your philosophy through the use of those words. But in my spirit and in my heart, I was grieved. Because on the one hand, I mean, I, I thought God was a loving God, a benevolent God. He didn't want any to perish. He wanted all to be saved. And it was to his grief and disappointment that men were rejecting the gospel. But then I thought, on the other hand, well, is the Bible teaching this? Is the Bible teaching that God only wants some to be saved and some to be damned? That he chooses in eternity's past? Who's going to go to heaven? Who's going to go to hell? And there was a conflict in my soul. And it, it was one of the only times in my life that I felt the Holy Spirit within me deeply grieved. I, I, I felt the Holy Spirit within me completely broken hearted that I was being exposed to this type of thinking and that I thought it might be true. And there, there, was, there was torment in me. And I thought, well, I can't go by my feelings. I can't just live by feelings. I must go by what the Bible says. And so for a very short time, because I, I didn't know the Bible in context as a new convert, I was drawn aside by this doctrine of Calvinistic predestination. But the more I read the Bible through and through, and the more I examined their proof texts in context, uh, the more I was convinced out of it. Now, as I said, it is not scriptural, but philosophical. And this is why. In the Calvinistic system of TULIP, that's their abbreviation, it's pre unconditional election is only necessary if their view of total inability or total depravity is true. TULIP, it's an acronym, for total depravity, and by that they mean human nature, not character. Human nature is depraved, free will has been lost. So you could really call it total inability. Then they have unconditional election, and unconditional means God does not elect you based on what you have done, you're not part of the elect because you repented and believed. You repented and believed because you are part of the elect. That's their doctrine. Then comes limited atonement. That Christ did not die for everyone. And that, again, is a conclusion based upon their philosophy of the nature of the atonement. If the nature of the atonement was a payment of a debt, then it had to be limited. Otherwise, everyone would have their debt paid, nobody would have a debt to pay, nobody could go to hell. So the Calvinist will say, you either need to be a universalist or believe in limited atonement. And they set that up because they, they, given their view of the nature of the atonement, it's not a provisionary measure that offers forgiveness. It's something that automatically and must save. So that's a limited atonement. Irresistible grace. And then, perseverance of the saints. 
which is what we just talked about. Once saved, always saved. Not that you must persevere to be saved, but that if you are saved, you will persevere. That's their doctrine. They come to this idea of an unconditional election based upon their view of total depravity. If man has no free will, if his nature itself is sinful and necessitates a sinful life, then man cannot choose God, man cannot come to God, man cannot believe the gospel, therefore his only hope is an unconditional election. That's the only way a man can be saved if there is no free will. And so Augustine, coming out of Gnosticism, out of Manichaeanism and being convinced that it was necessary to deny free will in order to affirm the grace of God, then once that was established by him, came up with this view of unconditional election. So they came to the Bible to find these proof texts for it. If Paul really was teaching in Romans 9 or in Ephesians uh, unconditional election, why is it that none of the churches started by Paul or none of the church for the first 300, 400 years before Augustine believed in it? If it was a doctrine taught by the apostle, you would at least find some remnants of it in the early church. And instead of teaching an unconditional election based upon a total depravity, they taught the doctrine of free will. That your destiny is in your own hands in contradiction to the fatalism, that your destiny is, you know, fated by the stars. And so this unconditional election, based upon this philosophical idea that originated in Gnosticism, was brought into the church through Augustine, and then later propagated through Calvin and Luther. It was not adopted universally throughout the church. In fact, that's the thing with the, uh, the change in church history around Augustine. Augustine uh, had brought a, a radical change to theology before the church even realized what happened. You see, the church over in the East, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, never came under the Augustinian influence. They never, they never taught an unconditional election. They never taught a total depravity. They still continued to teach the freedom of the will. Well. If it was the doctrine of the early church, you would expect that doctrine to be in the West and in the East. If it didn't start with Augustine, then you wouldn't expect to find it only in the church of the West where Augustine was. But that's where it was found, and not in the East, only in the West. And uh, so they came to the Bible looking for these proof texts and thought that they found it in Romans. Now, that's not what Paul was teaching in Romans chapter 9. If you read Paul's argument in context, he is talking about the Jews and the Gentiles as nations, not as individuals. In other words, election or predestination is not individual but national. If, if you, I mean, the rule of hermeneutics is to take the Bible in its context. So you can't isolate Romans chapter 9. You must look at Romans chapter 10. You must look at Romans chapter 11. And if you will read Romans 9, 10, and 11 over and over and over again, just read it the first time, one time, in context, all in one reading, you'll see that Paul's point is about Jew and Gentile. Jew and Gentile. You see, in the days of the Reformation, the debate was, has God predestined individuals? The, de the debate in the early church was not, has God predestined individuals, but has God elected the Gentiles? The Jews are not the Jews, the chosen people. Are the Jews unconditionally elected and the Gentiles reprobated? But no. The Jews were chosen to be a light unto the Gentiles. In other words, the Gentiles was not a, a second-hand decision based upon something new, that the Jews rejected it, therefore he's going to the Gentiles. But no, the Gentiles were chosen to be a, a light unto the nations. That God said to Abraham, through your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. 
In other words, through Christ shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And so the, the doctrine of the early church regarding predestination and election is that God had predetermined to have a people from both Jew and Gentile. It was, it was a predetermined plan. Not that he determined who those people would be, but that he would have a people from both Jew and Gentile. And like I said, Augustine influenced the church and made radical changes in theology before the church even realized what happened. He debated on the issue of free will, this unconditional election, while Augustine taught the election unto salvation, he did not explicitly teach a reprobation unto damnation. And some of his followers after that started to teach that God had elected some and therefore reprobated others. And you know what the church did? Accused them of heresy and condemned them at, for, for heresy. I can give you counsel after counsel where this Augustinian view of election was, was logically taught to the point of reprobation and the church condemned it. Even the Church of the West. And so it was not until the Protestant Reformation when they started their own church and Calvin and Luther that then this became acceptable. Though it's interesting, they will point to say the Council of Orange that condemned uh, the doctrines of the Pelagians. But that same council condemned their own doctrine of unconditional election and reprobation. The same council. So if the council has authority in the one matter as they appeal to it, then it has authority in the other matter as well. Of course, that contradicts their whole, uh, uh, you know, sola scriptura, uh, scripture alone, when they start appealing to church councils. Anyway, so if you read Romans chapter 9 in context, He's talking about the Jew and Gentile. Now he says, verse 5, Who are the fathers of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. Not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. He starts arguing, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In other words, a person is not saved and part of the covenant simply because they're a child of, of Abraham's body. It was a, to be a child by faith. They are Israel, you see. The Jews thought, I'm a, that's why John the Baptist said, don't say that we are children of Abraham. God can make children of Abraham out of these stones, but bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. In other words, the Jews were not chosen in an unconditional sense. It was conditional, which is shown by the fact that they were cut off because of their unbelief. Paul is arguing that the real children of Abraham are those who are by faith. That includes the Gentiles. He... Uh, it says in verse 24, Even us whom he has called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Verse 30. Now this is, this is he's summarizing what he's trying to, to prove. He says, what shall we say then? In other words, what he's been talking about in Romans 9 has to do with this issue. What shall we say then? What's the conclusion of the matter? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness have attained to the righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed, not after, the law, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not, attained of the law of right, have not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by works of the law. Well, wait a minute. If Paul was arguing for an eternal and unconditional election and reprobation, why is he then saying Israel was cut off because they sought it not by faith? This is conditional. He's saying, why, is, why are the Gentiles being saved? Because of their faith. Why are the Jews not being saved? Because of their unbelief. This is conditional. Well, if Paul was arguing Romans 9, 
that it was an unconditional and eternal, then why is he concluding the matter with these conditional statements? So when he talks about God chose uh, Jacob over Esau, well, hey, isn't that individual predestination? Well, remember what God said in Genesis. There are two nations in your womb. And what, what was Jacob chosen for? Eternal heaven unconditionally? No. But to be the chosen people that would inherit the promised land through which the Messiah would come, to be the partakers of the covenant God made with Abraham. It was not a, uh, an election or a predestination of for heaven. And what was Esau chosen for? Well, he just simply was not chosen to be the chosen people. Not that Esau was chosen for unconditional damnation. God showed in the Old Testament his heart for Nineveh, a Gentile city. They were not part of the chosen people. So here you see God bringing judgment upon the chosen people, Israel, and yet God was, elect, or God was saving the, Gent uh, the Gentiles in Nineveh who were not the chosen people. Because being chosen in that context was not salvation and damnation. And so to use what Paul is talking about, Jacob and Esau, in reference to eternal damnation and eternal salvation, is to completely take the whole scripture out of context. Now, uh, you also have the book of uh, Ephesians, where God has elected us in Him before the foundation of the world. That sounds like an individual predestination. Well, you have to understand the book of Acts tells us the, the church in Ephesus was made up of Jew and Gentile. So when Paul, who was the apostle to the Gentiles, is writing to this church, he says, God has chosen us, in other words, Jew and Gentile, to be in him before the foundation of the world. Paul was... Uh, being the apostle to the Gentiles was defending his ministry in, 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 in essence. Whereas Peter was an uh, apostle to the Jews. And that's why it's always Paul who's talking about election. And Paul who's talking about predestination. <clears throat> because it had to do with God choosing to grant repentance onto the Gentiles. <clears throat> Thank you, dear. Now the best commentary that I know of on Romans 9, 10, and 11, the best commentary on the entire book of Ephesians is a book called The Mystery of Christ Revealed, The Key to Predestination by Brother Jed Smock. And he deals with this thoroughly. Now, I only have, you know, a short time, 30 minutes. I can't go verse by verse through all of Romans 9, 10, and 11 and all of Ephesians so if you, uh, if you want a commentary on every particular verse in these scriptures, The Mystery of Christ Revealed by Brother Jed Smock is the book you need to get. And that's on lulu.com. Brother Jed made it available for very cheap. So I want to state, rather than an exhaustive uh, commentary on all these verses, just an alternative understanding of them which I just did, and state some objections as based on the scriptures. Uh, first of all, the impression that I get from the Bible is that God wants all men to be saved. That there's no partiality with God. The Bible speaks of the benevolence of God as universal. That God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. The impression here is not a limitation but a universal benevolence that God has, that God is love. Now there is some uh, sense in which God has a hatred for sin and sinners, but that's not a maliciousness of the will. God can have an abhorrence of a sinner because of their sin, while at the same time having a benevolence in His will for their good. So when the Bible does talk about God's hatred, that's not the opposite of God's love. The opposite of love is selfishness. But I can say, I hate certain types of characters, certain types of behaviors and the way people act, and hate them because of the way they act while still having a benevolence of heart for them, willing their good, while abhorring their conduct, willing their good. <clears throat> 
So the Bible gives the impression that God has a universal benevolence for all and that that love, that benevolence is unconditional while we were yet sinners. He loved us and died for us while on the same time there's a conditional type of love, a personal delight. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. It's a different type of love. Okay. The impression of the Bible is regarding the atonement that it's unlimited. Which also shows God's heart for all men to be saved. And unlimited, the Bible says he tasted death for every man. Not for every type of man, but for every man. The Bible says he's the propitiation for our sins. Not only for our sins, but for the sins of the world. Not only for us, but for the sins of the world. Again, it's a, the impression of an unlimited, not limited, but unlimited atonement, which is a reflection of the heart of God and the will of God. And it says that uh, you can cause your brother to stumble and not to cause your brother to perish for whom Christ died. In other words, Christ died for those who perish. The Bible talks about false teachers who bring upon themselves swift destruction, who deny the Lord that bought them. In other words, the Lord bought those who perish and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So Christ did not merely die for those who go to heaven. Christ even died for those who go to hell. So that's an unlimited atonement which shows God's will for the salvation of those who even go to hell. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they would turn and live. People go to hell, not because God is unwilling to save them, but because they refuse to repent, and therefore the good of His universe demands their damnation. It's done out of a sense of public justice, not out of a, not out of a personal unwillingness in the heart of God. And... Uh, the Bible says Jesus died to reconcile us to himself, reconcile us to God by the sacrifice of his son. But yet after the atonement, we're, men are told, be ye reconciled to God. Well, what does that imply? Be ye reconciled to God. That's something you're commanded to do. That means reconciliation requires your choice. But even though Christ died to reconcile us, reconciliation must take place after the atonement. So it shows that the atonement is a provision through which there is reconciliation, but not something in and of itself, independent of us, reconciles us. Jesus shed his blood for the remission of sins. Yet after the atonement is made, we're told to repent for the remission of sins. So that means that the atonement does not bring the remission of sins independent of what we do. Evil. It's not just uh, Christians who can appreciate a good hero, even the unsaved admire it. The virtue and the character of the hero of the story, the self-sacrifice. Even the sinners can see that bad guy is a bad guy and their own conscience condemns him. You see, so God has so constituted us in that way, so when his character is properly presented and understood, we see his mercy and his love and his goodness and his justice, our mind should not be able to condemn it, but wouldn't be able to help but to love it and to approve of it. And so we ought to see God and view God and preach God and display God in such a way that the conscience of man cannot help but to approve of his ways. So how does this affect evangelism? Well, in evangelism I can honestly offer salvation to all men knowing that it's the will of God for them to be saved. And I can tell them that it's in their own hands, that if they're damned, it's not because God was not willing to save them, and it's not because the atonement wasn't made for them, it's because of their own neglect. You know, the Bible says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Well, how can we neglect it at all? If the atonement automatically and unconditionally saves, given that it's the nature of a payment of a debt of some kind, then we can't neglect our salvation. If God has eternally elected us for salvation and is bringing it about through an irresistible grace, then we cannot neglect our salvation. How is it that the Bible warns us not to neglect our salvation? And so I can do the same out on the streets. I can warn them. Listen, salvation is available. 
Christ has died for you. God is calling you to repent. God would love nothing more than for you to come to Him, that He will be gracious in forgiving you. But if you neglect this salvation, then you will perish. In evangelism, if the future is not predestined, but God uh, is making His plans in light of what we choose, as we saw with the cities, God wants to bless or God wants to curse. He makes His plans for them, His future plans for them, based upon what they're choosing and that they have alternative choices. Then in evangelism, we can literally change the future. And if we're negligent of evangelism, we can severely damage someone's future. That there might be souls in this world that will be saved because of your work. And that if you neglect your work, they might not be saved at all. You know, I think every time I tell a sinner, repent or perish, or turn or burn, that's implying that he has two futures to choose from. Uh, his future could either be heaven with God through repentance or hell damnation through his own sin, negligence. So I'm presenting every preacher that says turn or burn or every preacher that says repent or perish is presupposing an open future that the sinner has a choice to choose. You know, if God had predestined the, their sin, then how can they come under the conviction of sin? And without conviction, there can be no true conversion. Now, there is a sense in which, pre, you know, you can predestine something in a way that's compatible with free will. I predestined to teach you guys here at this conference. This was not a, a second thought. This was my predetermined plan. I'm going to teach people at my conference. But my predetermination does not hinder or force your freedom to come. You chose to come here. So there is a sense in which you can have some, you know, God can predetermine an event, and yet those who bring about that event and participate in it are certainly free. We see that in the atonement of Christ. Men voluntarily acted in the atonement when they arrested him and so on and so forth, and yet God had predetermined that Christ would come and be crucified and slain. But this is not a predestination that's incompatible with human freedom, and therefore it's not incompatible with human responsibility. But if you so interpret predestination as to exclude the possibility of free will, that man has no choice but to act in that way, and that it's irresistible, well then this is certainly contrary to human responsibility and accountability. How can a man condemn himself for doing that which he knows he couldn't help but to do. So you, you exclude any possibility of conviction of sin. If, you, if the man is convinced that that sin was something he couldn't help but to do, but was the irresistible will of God. So in evangelism, we ought to present the fact that they're sinners by choice and choosing to sin by choice. And this is calculated in its nature to convince their minds that they're guilty, to convict their minds that they're deserving of damnation. The word conviction is a legal term. It's in a court of law, someone is accused of a crime, evidence is brought forth to show that he's guilty of the crime, and if the evidence shows and convinces the jury that he's guilty, there's a conviction. He's convicted. And conviction of sin is the same way. Except we are the jury. You could say our conscience is the jury. And when we go out and we minister, we're accusing them of being guilty and in need of a savior. And you can bring forth the evidence of their crimes, the sins that they've committed, the transgressions, the laws that they've broken. And then their mind becomes convinced that they are guilty. And there's the conviction. Conviction, in the biblical sense, it's self-incrimination. Uh, and this is only possible if a man understands his own freedom in doing those actions and that he could have done otherwise. Now, sinners blame God for their sin. Remember we said Adam, when he was asked by God, what is this that thou hast done? And, God, and Adam said... You know, the woman that you gave me, 
uh, trying to blame the woman and ultimately blame God. Well, as I said in a previous lecture, if Adam only knew that what he did was the sovereign and eternal and irresistible decree of God, he would have had a better excuse than the, than the mere woman. Ultimately, this excuses sinners, it justifies sinners, and it condemns God. And it's not the presentation and impression I get the more I read the Bible. I fear people who hold to this doctrine, not all of them, but many of them, they, they, they get this philosophy, it suits them in their sinful condition to think that they're unconditionally elected for heaven, no matter what they do, no matter how they live, they're covered by the atonement and elected by God, and it suits their sinful life, and they're given proof texts that seem to support it. Here's a verse here, here's a verse there, and they hold on to these as their proof. But the more I read the Bible over and over again, the more I can't help but to see that our destiny is in our own hands, that God would rather this world be much different than it is, and that God has great heart, a great love, and great mercy that He's offering to all, and that God has done all that He can to save as many as He can, and that those who are not saved are not damned because of the negligence of God. Well, I think that would conclude the lecture I was predestined to give. <laughs> Those, again, this is not supposed to be an exhaustive uh, examination of this doctrine, but just an alternative perspective for you to study on your own to see if, see if you can't see the election of the Jew and Gentile in Ephesians and in Romans. Uh, the more you examine those texts, I'm sure the more you'll see it and uh, how incompatible this doctrine is with the full counsel of God's Word. So uh, let's take a five, ten minute break and uh, and then we'll get back to it. Did you see the new question and answer after every session? Yeah, we're gonna, well, we're going to do question and answers at the very end. I'm just going to make time for it. So. I hit record. I don't know how to get it back there. It's just Okay.